Hello, my name is Benjamin Nguyen. I'm a professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at GT Southwestern Medical Center. I am delighted to be here to share with you all what rehabilitation has to offer in patients with MSA. All right, so uh, thank you. So first of all, what is PMNR? PMNR is a branch of medicine that emphasizes prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of disorder as it relates to nerves, muscle, and bones that may produce temporary or permanent uh, impairment. Uh, so uh, in another word, PMNR is a branch of medicine that aims to enhance and restore functional ability and quality of life to those with physical impairment or disability. So you have known about M MSA. So basically it's a no onset progressive neurodegenerative disease, uh, which is accompanied by autonomic failure as well as movement disorder. And these two condition can greatly impair quality of life as well as the ability for people to carry out activities. Uh, and now there are two types, there are hypo, three types. Uh, there are hypokinetic rigid Parkinson type or MSAP. Uh, and then there's also the cerebellar syndrome or MSAC or a third mixed type, MSAM. Uh, a common feature in these patients is the problem with orthostasis, uh, urinary incontinence, as well as electric erectile dysfunction. Now, because of these conditions, the MSA are aggressive, cause aggressive uh, and progressive disability. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of treatment to uh, prevent MSA or treat MSA, and the mean survival is only six to 10 years. However, it's six to 10 years is still a long time uh, for you to, to be important. So that is still important to try to maintain a quality of life. Uh, and then the main thing that we do with MSA is symptomatic treatment. And currently there's very limited data on the role of inpatient rehabilitation uh, for MSA. Uh, however, that says, you know, we can certainly address the motor dysfunction, the non-motor dysfunction, as well as significant quality of life issue. Now there is report that for spinal cerebellar degenerative disease, inpatient rehabilitation improved their motor score, their non-motor score, as well as their quality of life. The, briefly, this is the inpatient therapy team member at the middle, at the center is the patient. And of course, the physician is the lead. And the physician, what he or she does is to make sure that there are no medical condition that may impede a patient ability to participate mean, meaningfully in the patient we have. And of course, we the other team member are the nursing staff. They will help with the bowel and bladder dysfunction in patients with MSA, uh, also help with skin integrity, uh, patient family education, and our physical therapists will help with uh, coordination, gait training, uh, ambulation. Our speech therapists will talk work with communication, swallowing, cognition. Our occupational therapists will address the activities that they are living, uh, equipment, uh, functional transfer. Our dietitian will help educate the patient on the importance of small frequent meals, uh, minimizing uh, carbohydrate. Uh, our case manager will help with discharge planning, secure additional resources. Uh, and then our psychologist will also help with coping adjustment. Uh, so as you can see, there are multiple members on the inpatient rehab team that will be able to assist with a patient with MSA. All right, so this is uh, some of the motor disorder for those with MSA. And unfortunately, the main thing that we have at this time is just symptomatic treatment. So for MSAP, uh, we can try medications such as levodopa, carpidopa, and amantadine. Uh, now, amantadine, it can cause or worsening of orthostatic hypotension. So that's why we are very reluctant to add medication because they may affect uh, for patient with MSA. Uh, now the OT will have been shown to improve motor function and quality of life in patient with mild to moderate MSA. Currently there are no physical therapy research uh, published on outcome on uh, MSA. However, they have a lot of physical therapy that shows great benefit in patient with Parkinson. Now for those with MSAC, uh, the therapist can also address the ataxia, the dysarthria, uh, the tremor, the ocular motor dysfunction uh, for MSAM, uh, very similar to uh, uh, Parkinson's patient, 
a mixture of LF so they will also benefit from the ongoing therapy. And of course, sometimes they have problem with dystonia or spasticity, which can be treated with botulinum toxin. Uh, this is some of the other autonomic failure among common in pitch with MSA, uh, urinary dysfunction. This is when you have the disconnect, the disinertia between the sphincter and the bladder, uh, and it can lead to incomplete voiding. Uh, and then the treatment for this is very simple, intermittent straight calf, uh, four to six times a day, and nursing will help teach the patient how to do the intermittent straight calf, as well as to check for the post void residual to make sure that the bladder is completely empty. Another thing that we can address is constipation. I mean, those that have been say, just tell them to push fluid, adjust the bowel med, and put them on a bowel program. And of course, another problem common in patients with MSA is uh, the decrease in sweating. And as you know, we need to sweat to cool down. So if you can't sweat, the patient is at risk for heat stroke, heat cramp, uh, exhaustion. So it's, again, it's about uh, patient education. And the orthostatic hypotension is one of the biggest challenge faced by patients with FNSA. And there are lots of different uh, treatment for it, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. Uh, non-pharmacologic can be as simple as elastic stocking, abdominal binders, keep the head of the bed elevated at night, uh, have them uh, increase in salt intake, um, adequate fluid, uh, small frequent meal. Uh, again, this is patient education. Uh, also, the pharmacist can come and help review the patient medication to see what, if any, medication may contribute to orthostatic hypotension. And of course, with postprandial hypotension is fairly common too. And this is where the dietitian uh, and can come and educate the patient on the importance of a small frequent meals. Uh, many patients with MSA also have uh, neuropsychiatric issues such as depression, uh, cognitive impairment, uh, as well as sleep impairment. And this can be addressed by the psychologist, the chaplain, the psychiatrist, uh, the speech therapist. And for the sleep, you know, we can measure the patient sleeping at night with pulse oximeter, and then we can make the appropriate referral uh, and the appropriate treatment for to address the sleep disorder. And of course, you know, you we also teach the patient to avoid certain medication with certain sleep conditions, such as. You want to avoid clonazepam and those who have stopped to sleep apnea because it can actually worsen that. So in conclusion, there's limited data on inpatient rehabilitation and MSA. There is strong data on inpatient rehabilitation benefits in those with Parkinson's. Uh, and again, the PT, the OT, and the speech uh, will help maintain mobility, prevent contracture, improve the quality of life, improve maintaining speech, and swallowing, and our nursing staff will also help educate the patient on bowel, bladder, skin, and family education. Uh, so here's a picture of our uh, therapy gym at the uh, Zellifshi Pavilion, and this is the team member of Infantry Rehab. Thank you very much. Uh, and then I'll be back and answer any question that you may have on the Infantry Rehabilitation at our next session. Hello, everyone, and thank you for your time. My name is Raquel Dilde, and I'm a speech language pathologist at the UT Southwestern Medical Center. And today we're going to be talking about managing speech and swallowing symptoms in multiple system atrophy. So some medical terminology related to MSA is dysarthria, which is a neurogenic speech disorder characterized by abnormalities in the strength, speed, range, steadiness, tone, or accuracy of movements required for breathing, phonatory, resonatory, articulatory, or prosodic aspects of speech production. And dysphagia is a swallowing disorder involving the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, and gastroesophageal junction. And speech pathologists mostly focus on assessment and treatment of the oral cavity and pharynx. So how do I find a speech pathologist? So first, I recommend that you start by informing your medical doctor of any speech or swallowing symptoms, and then your provider will place a referral to a speech language pathologist for you. Some signs and symptoms of dysarthria include slowed rate or slurred speech, breathy or hoarse vocal quality, decreased speaking volume, monotone or reduced inflection of the voice, Difficulty with articulating sounds or coordination of speech sounds, which is mostly seen in MSAC, but sometimes can be present in MSAP as well. 
reduced breath support when speaking, and a common complaint that I hear is I feel like I'm running out of air when talking. So how do we assess for dysarthria? So a speech language pathologist or an SLP will gather medical history. They will perform a cranial nerve or oral mechanism exam to test the muscles you use for speech and swallowing. They may have you perform speech and non-speech tasks. An example of one of those might be holding out the vowel sound ah for as long as you can. And then the SLP will measure and rate your range of motion, coordination, strength, and sensation. From there, they will identify any areas of impairment, and then you can develop a plan of care together to address any impairment areas. So what are the treatment options for dysarthria? So a common treatment is Lee Silverman voice treatment. Um, and this is an intensive voice therapy program that's four times a week for four weeks. And the goal is to really help with the strength um, and mobility of the vocal cords um, to help maintain uh, your ability to project your voice. Another popular treatment is the Speak Out program by Parkinson Voice Project. Um, and both of these treatments um, can be used for both MSA-P and MSA-C types. Another treatment option is expiratory and inspiratory muscle strength training to help activate the respiratory muscles we use for our voice. You can also identify compensatory speaking strategies, um, traditional articulation therapy, mostly with MSA-C type, where you identify sounds um, that are not articulated clearly, um, and from there, you break them down and practice rep repetitive drills um, to help the clarity of speech. And then you can also use augmentative alternative communication. So what are compensatory speech strategies? So one, you might over articulate consonants or move your mouth bigger to help project um, and speak more clearly. Speaking slowly, breathing deeply before speaking, pausing to insert more time for breathing, shorten your message, plan out important conversations when well-rested, and establishing a yes-no system. So earlier I talked about augmentative alternative communication as um, a type of treatment for dysarthria. So what is AAC? This is anything that supplements or compensates for impairments in speech language production and or comprehension, including spoken and written modes of communication. And AAC has different levels from no technology required, low technology, all the way to high technology options. So what are some no tech or low tech options? Um, one, gestures are a great way to start um, that supplement that don't require any sort of equipment. Uh, picture books and boards that may display um, a message or a communication want or need and a voice amplifier. So an example of using a voice amplifier is if you are in your living room area, your partner is in the kitchen, and you're trying to project your voice, you may have an amplifier that you turn on and use to amplify um, the sound or the loudness of your voice, um, and then you turn it off. So just using it as needed. Some high-tech speech generating devices. Um, so these are devices that generate a personalized message for you. It may look like an iPad, a Windows tablet, or even a specialized device. Um, you can use these by directly selecting a message um, from a keyboard or on a touch screen. And if there's upper extremity weakness or limited mobility, an eye gaze device can be trialed. Um, and one tip that I recommend is that if you think that you would benefit from a high technology speech generating device, try to start this process as early as you can because they can take many months to actually obtain a device. So moving on and talking about swallowing. So what are some signs and symptoms of dysphagia? Slowed rate of chewing or longer to finish meals, drooling or liquid that seeps from the corners of the mouth, a hard time moving food from the front to the back of the mouth, coughing or throat clearing during meals, or a wet gurgly sounding voice during or after your meals. How do we assess for dysphagia? So we'll gather a medical history, perform the same oral mechanism or cranial nerve examination. 
Um, and then perform a clinical swallowing evaluation. This is where the SLP will observe the patient trying to eat and drink different textures. And then from there, we can identify if further testing is needed, such as an imaging study. And a tip that I recommend is that if you have foods that you know are giving you trouble, bring those to your first assessment with an SLP or the first follow-up, because this will give your therapist very helpful information. Different types of imaging assessments for dysphagia include a modified barium swallow study, I explain this to my patients that this is an x-ray video of your swallow to see what the muscles are doing when you swallow different textures. And then a flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, which is also called FEES. Um, and this is a scope that's gone through the nose and down the throat to visualize the structures um, of the, the muscles that we use during swallowing. What is the purpose of these imaging studies? So first we want to identify if aspiration of food or liquids are occurring. So aspiration, meaning the food or liquid seeping over into the lungs. These studies help us to guide treatment planning and they also help to assist us with identification of what specific compensatory swallowing strategies may be most beneficial for the patient. How do we treat dysphagia? So there are different dysphagia exercises. Um, there has been limited research specifically for um, the population of MSA, um, but there has been a lot of research done with similar diagnoses or similar um, symptoms of dysphagia. So they have been shown that they may be effective in maintenance of strength and coordination of the swallow in those early stages of MSA. We can help identify compensatory swallowing and mealtime strategies, diet modifications, and also identify if any adaptive equipment is needed for swallowing. So what are compensatory swallowing strategies? Taking smaller bites and sips, alternating solids and liquids, smaller meals more frequently during the day, which can help conserve the um, energy while you're eating. Um, and I also work closely with our registered dietitian um, to uh, the dietitian can help identify any strategies to maintain adequate nutrition and hydration. Um, another swallow strategy may be to cough or throat clear intentionally and try to swallow as quickly as you can. And then other diet modifications may be uh, identifying softer foods or thickening liquids if needed. And lastly, some adaptive drinking equipment, um, which can be either a safe straw or a prevail cup. And the purpose of both of these is to limit how much liquid is presented at one time, which then can potentially reduce the risk of choking or those aspiration episodes. And I have my references and resources listed here um, for different treatment options that I discussed today. So again, I want to thank you for your time and I hope that this has been helpful um, with identifying some strategies for speech and swallowing symptoms in MSA. Hello and welcome. It is my joy and honor to be with you guys. My name is Sarah Milligan and I'm an occupational therapist here at UT Southwestern. And I'm looking forward to talking with y'all about the role of occupational therapy and multiple system atrophy. So let's go ahead and dive on in into what we like to prioritize our treatment sessions on. The first thing is <clears throat> occupational therapists, we are the experts in upper extremity function. So shoulder down to fingertips, we're looking at your available movement, your strength, your coordination and your sensation. And it's our job to prescribe exercises and stretches and splints and positioners to help maximize your available movement. The next role that we have is we want to emphasize your participation in the activities that matter most to you. So we do a lot of education about different forms of adaptive equipment, energy conservation strategies, wheelchair seating assessments, and home modifications to help promote your participation in the activities that matter most to you. The last one is that we'd help to facilitate the preservation of roles for the person and their loved ones. So we talk about what are the most important roles that you would like to maintain throughout your continuum. And we help to provide assistance for caregivers for respite 
or any other services that are needed. Um, this next slide talks about the most common forms of exercises and stretches and splints that we prescribe. I would love to get a shout out to the reference that's listed at the bottom of your screen. Um, a lot of these ideas were from Scott Bergener, who's an OT and has a really great presentation on the role of OT with people with ALS. And I can't help but share that there's a lot of similarities between what we do with people with MSA and ALS. So some examples are table so tabletop slides, and these help to stretch the shoulder and the back. And then we talk about ways that you can stretch yourself, and we're trying to stretch those arms and stretch those hands in the opposite position of where they want to rest in. Uh, so we talk about shoulder flexion and external rotation, elbow extension, and form supination and wrist and finger extension. We try to instruct you on ways to stretch yourself. And then as things change, we help to teach caregivers or family members on how best to stretch you. So that way we help to make sure that you are not in pain and that we help promote the healthy integrity of our joints. To the right of your screen, those are the three most common splints that we prescribe. That first one being a C-bar splint or a C-splint, it helps with approximating a pincer grasp for our fine motor tasks. The next one to the right is what's considered a wrist cock-up splint, and that's to help facilitate a light grasp onto objects when we have wrist drop. The final splint there at the bottom of your screen is a resting hand splint. And this is something that helps to prevent joint contractures or when a joint gets fixed and rigid um, in a certain location that helps with promoting the wrists and the fingers in an optimal position. The next slide I have is about adaptive equipment. Our job is to talk to you extensively about those activities that you're having difficulties with and for us to use our creative brains and our problem solving strategies to find equipment that might work best for you. Um, for example, those top two pictures are forms of feeding equipment. So we've got a plate guard and we've also got a universal cuff that goes around the um, MP joints of the hand that we can attach different utensils to, like you see in the spoon with the berries. The next picture is a Dyson placemat, and that helps with preventing things from slipping off of services. Next up is a reacher, very common form of adaptive equipment that we can use to retrieve items or to help perform lower body dressing. Then on the bottom section of that screen, we're looking at a long handled sponge, which helps to reach different areas of your back and your lower body a little bit more easily when you're showering. And then we've got tuba grip, which we can place onto different items like pens or utensils or combs or toothbrushes. And that helps with facilitating a larger grasp. So you're having to use less um, strength and motor control for that task. And then last up, a lot of people enjoy using their phones. And so that's a positioner that can either drape around the neck or can hang out on the tabletop for you to be able to engage with your phone in a different way. Next up are energy conservation strategies. Implementing these most consistently helps us to be a little bit more mindful about how our body and our mind are engaging throughout our daily activities. So it's a way to kind of think smarter, not harder at making sure that we're being mindful of what's the most important activity of your day and helping to facilitate your engagement through that. I've got a list on the screen about the six P's of energy conservation strategies, pacing, planning, prioritizing, positioning, slip breathing, and a positive attitude but we go through those strategies in our occupational therapy sessions to help facilitate your participation in your daily activities. Next up are home modifications. So we can assist with recommending different home modifications or equipment to help prevent falls, support universal design and foster your participation in your desired activities. So that far picture on your left is an example of a tub setup where we have grab bars, 
We have our shower head that you can use handheld. We have a tub transfer bench. Those are ideas of way to help promote safety um, and independence with showering. And you see that we have ramps on the next um, picture there. And then on the final picture is just an idea of a kitchen setup where things are available at a lower height for someone navigating that in a wheelchair. So next steps, if any of this information resonated with you at all, please reach out to one of your providers and request an occupational therapy referral. It's our job as OTs to really focus on you as an individual and to make sure that we are coming up with interventions and ideas to help maximize your quality of life across the continuum of your care. But thank you guys so very much for joining me in occupational therapy with people with multiple system atrophy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shannon Kimbrell, and I'm a physical therapist here at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. I am a board certified neurological clinical specialist in physical therapy, and I'm going to be talking today about physical therapy for those with multiple system atrophy. All right, so first we're going to talk about what physical therapy is. Our American Physical Therapy Association has defined physical therapists as movement experts who improve quality of life through prescribed exercise, hands-on care, and patient education. We examine each person and then develop a treatment plan to improve their ability to move, reduce or manage pain, and prevent further disability. We work as a part of an interdisciplinary team. As you can see, there are a lot of different types of um, clinicians, physicians speaking throughout this coalition. So we all work together to provide best care for our patients. Most importantly, we try to treat the person and not the diagnosis. And what that means is that we try to tailor our treatments based on how each person presents and what their individual goals are. So today I'm briefly going to review what we can do as physical therapists to provide for those with MSA. So the different types of MSA um, that I'm going to kind of briefly discuss are MSA with the P type, the Parkinsonism. And within this population, most of the literature that we utilize is coming from those um, that have Parkinson's disease. MSA has not um, been researched quite enough to provide a lot of solid evidence for physical therapy. So we gather a lot of what we do for those with Parkinson's. So we are going to, a lot of times, implement moderate to high intensity aerobic exercise to improve their oxygen consumption and functional outcomes. We're gonna implement balance training intervention programs, which can help reduce postural control impairments, improve balance, mobility, balance confidence, and quality of life. We're also going to implement gait training to reduce motor disease severity, improve kinematics of gait, so stride length, your speed, and then also general mobility and balance. We will also implement flexibility exercises to improve your range of motion. So while we do utilize um, strategies to help with this. We try to give this more in a home exercise program. Research has not really supported tailoring whole sessions to just flexibility. So we do wanna focus on all major muscle groups, um, but we really wanna focus with um, higher intensity on targeting the trunk rotation, okay? So there are some programs such as LSVT and power that we utilize in those that have Parkinson's disease. And these exercises do implement trunk rotation throughout each activity. So these are options for those with MSA as well. And then we also look at dynamic stretching and static stretching with exercise. Finally, we do like to implement resistance training. This helps reduce motor disease severity and improve strength, power, and non-motor symptoms such as anxiety and depression quality of life, and overall functional outcomes. So next, I'm gonna talk about the cerebellar type. So we do look at implementing intensive 
physical therapy for both gait and balance. Um, these have actually been found to be helpful. And there has been more research recently with MSA that shows that physical therapy um, encompassing different types of strategies and different domains of exercise can improve an individual's gait and balance. So we also will give home exercise programs for um, persons to manage their symptoms at home. Some of those domains include strengthening, postural control, balance training, coordination, and sensory stimulation. Other complications that we may address in our plan of care with those that have MSA include orthostatic hypotension, so significant drop in blood pressure with change in position. While we cannot directly change that, we can educate the patient and their caregivers or family members on different things that help mitigate those symptoms, such as compression stockings and abdominal binders, which most people don't enjoy wearing, um, delaying physical activity until later in the day and not right after the meal time, and then avoiding extreme heat. Another common, common complication of MSA is dystonia. Um, and there are different types of dystonia in different areas of the body, but this is something that we can address as therapists. So I'm gonna to talk to you now about durable medical equipment or DME. So this is not an all-inclusive list. It's just a list of some examples of equipment that we might recommend for our patients, including a used up walker, an up walker, hospital bed, grab bars, and wheelchairs, which I will talk a little more extensively about in the upcoming slides. Um, for the DME, we do need to have, or you would need to have an order from your physician. Um, and then this has to be sent to a vendor. So the vendor is the, the DME supplier. That supplier has to be in contract with your um, insurance company. So there are times certain insurance companies prefer a certain vendor and that is something that you could have a conversation with your company or um, your insurance for. And then the last thing is it does require med medical justification. And that comes from either the therapist or the physician recommending this equipment. Um, so wheelchair and seating is something I wanted to talk more about. Um, I have included information regarding Medicare as this is one of our more common um, insurances that we use. So this hyperlink here just has information on the Medicare page regarding wheelchairs and other DME and how they pay for it. So for example, Medicare covers DME for with a 20% copay. So depending on the cost of the um, equipment that will determine your copay. Um, one thing we recommend, especially with wheelchairs, you thinking about the future and the needs in the next five years. And the reason I say five years is generally they'll cover, and most insurances will also go off the Medicare model. Generally, they'll cover one wheelchair every five years. There are always exceptions to this rule. Um, if there's a large change in functional status, a functional decline in one chair does not work for someone anymore, then you know we can get sometimes a different chair in those five years. But for the most part, you want to plan for the next five years, which is very difficult. When getting a wheelchair, you can work forwards, but not backwards. And what that means is if you initially get a manual chair, you can then get a power chair in the future. But if you get a power chair covered, then the manual chair um, will not be covered in the future. Again, there are a few exceptions to that, but that's generally how you want to think of it. And then finally, the wheelchair and seating process. So this requires a face-to-face -face evaluation by a physical therapist, occupational therapist, physician, and then an ATP has to be present. So your ATP is your assistive technology professional. You will trial the wheelchair during the evaluation. Um, sometimes if the chair is not available during the evaluation, the vendor can bring you the equipment that they need um, that you would need to trial. And then once the paperwork is submitted, you choose your chair, the time from evaluation to receiving the chair is generally three to four months. 
Insurance authorization takes time, and that's usually the biggest holdup. Um, obviously, supply chain can change that time frame as well as we've seen in the past year or two. Um, but keep in mind, think about it as a three to four month process. And then finally, your chair is delivered to home and then you as a user will be educated on functions of the chair and ensure um, they will ensure that the, you understand how to use the device. These are my references for all the information I provided. And thank you for being present during my presentation. I hope that you were able to gain some valuable information from my slides. And thank you for letting me be a part of this coalition. I am very happy to share this information with you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Shilpa Chitnis. I'm a professor of neurology at UT Southwestern Medical Center. And I'm going to talk to you about the use of botulinum toxins in multiple system atrophy. So dystonia in multiple system atrophy takes on many different categories. So there is blepharospasm or eyelid spasm. There is orofacial dystonia. There is laryngeal spasm, which is called strider. There is neck dystonia or cervical dystonia. There is focal limb dystonia, overactive bladder. And then siluria is not a part of dystonia, but it is you know, excessive salivation that is seen in patients with MSA. So first, let's talk about what are botulinum toxins. This is a toxin that is basically derived from a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum, and it's an anaerobic. It's a bacteria that does not require oxygen, and it's a rod-shaped bacteria. It produces a neurotoxin that is called botulinum toxin. So this is the most potent biological toxin, and when in people that eat canned food uh, that's contaminated, uh, people that have you know a gangrene, so botulinum can present as paralysis, respiratory failure. And so how does this act? So this toxin acts at a nerve terminal, and this is a nerve terminal for a neurochemical called acetylcholine, hence it's called a cholinergic terminal. And then it cleaves and inactivates certain proteins, and these proteins are called snare proteins. So what snare proteins do is they take the vesicle that contains the neurochemical acetylcholine and attaches it to the presynaptic membrane so that the chemical can be released in the synapse or the junction to act on the receptors and you know cause its action, which is muscle contraction. So essentially by cleaving the snare proteins, the botulinum toxin inhibits the release of acetylcholine, hence prevents muscle contraction. And so there is local uh, weakness and paralysis or semi-paralysis. And so the biological effect of botulinum toxin is involuntary muscle contractions, you know, excess secretions, and, and basically pain. So how do we inject these toxins? So essentially in those troubled areas, which are affected, for example, if you think about a limb that has dystonia, uh, so you clean that area basically with, with an alcohol swab, we want to make sure that we hold any blood thinners for a few days. The primary care doctor might use a heparin bridge uh, because you know people have all kinds of conditions that require them to be anticoagulated. So you clean the area with an alcohol swab and you inject predetermined units of botulinum toxin. Some people have injection site pain. It's just like getting any other intramuscular injection. Uh, allergic reactions to the foreign protein, which is what the botulinum toxin is, can certainly happen, but this is a one to 1,000 fold dilution. If injected near the eyes and mouth, there can be dryness. If injected near the pharyngeal area, uh, there can be swallowing difficulty. The effects usually start anywhere between two days uh, to a week, and most people will get maximum benefit in about two weeks. The duration of the response may last about three 
months or 12 weeks, and then repeated injections are required for ongoing symptom relief. There is a long acting formulation in the works in clinical trials that's called daxybotulinum toxin, and the median duration of effect of this toxin is uh, apparently 24 weeks. So that is, you know, really six months, which means that the patient would require to get the injection only twice a year, which would be really good, as opposed to three or four times a year right now. So let's talk about each individual condition. So blepharospasm in MSA. This is, as you can see from this diagram here, it's an involuntary and persistent contraction of the muscle. This is a big muscle called orbicularis oculi, and this causes a spasmatic closure of the eyelids. And in general, association of blepharospasm in patients with MSA is quite rare, but treatment with local injections of botulinum toxin, these are the injection sites that I basically mentioned all around the orbicularis oculi muscle. And this can, you know, really uh, open the eyelids by semi-paralyzing these muscles that are contracting. And uh, the patient can sometimes have functional blindness. And so if you improve this, then obviously this is, you know, results in improvement of quality of life for the patient. So orofacial dyskinesia or dystonia, this is actually a red flag uh, for the diagnosis of MSA. Most people, you know, develop this when they take uh, levodopa, of, you know, or, or cinemat for treatment of the motor symptoms. So as you can see, all of these patients in the diagram that I have put here, they have sustained and painless dystonic spasms of the face as well as of the neck muscles, as you can see here, and it can be unilateral, and it can certainly, as I mentioned, be a manifestation of peak dose dystonia following increasing doses of levodopa. So jaw closing dystonia, where the jaw really clenches and uh, closes, and the patient is unable to open the jaw, is more common than jaw opening dystonia, and so botulinum toxins may certainly have a role in the management of these disabling symptoms. So what is stridor? Now, stridor occurs in MSA at various stages of the disease. And in general, it was attributed that stridor results from vocal cord you know, paralysis of, of muscles that you know, squeeze the larynx together. So they are, they're called you know, um, abductors. Uh, the mechanism, however, for stridor is really that there is dystonia or dyskinesia, spasm, of the vocal cords. So when it's severe, it can cause respiratory insufficiency. And some patients actually may require elective tracheostomy, which can be, which is a hole in the trachea, which can be life-saving. So, you know, when a patient is sleeping, the bed partner will see that the patient engages in very agonal respiration. And, you know, it's very, very characteristic. Now, bilateral injections of appropriate doses of botulinum toxins into the, the muscle, the, particularly the thyroarytenoid muscle, you know, might improve uh, the, the spasm and can result in improvement basically of, of strider, which is very helpful. So craniocervical dystonia in MSA. So cranio is head, uh, cervical is neck region. And there's craniocervical predilection for levodopa-induced dyskinesia, so medication-induced side effect. And the commonest presentation is when the neck is flexed and down, uh, as you see here, that's called anterocollis. And, and basically, botulinum toxin injections can be injected in two set of muscles. So the sternocleidomastoid, which are here, and then the scalenes, which are you know, right, right behind the sternocleidomastoid. Now, if you're going to inject one sternocleidomastoid, it is generally recommended to inject 50% of the dose in the other one because otherwise the patients can get swallowing difficulty or dysphagia. There is a muscle, uh, you know, which can be injected under general anesthesia, and this has been shown to be most helpful. This is a muscle here that is called longus coli, but unfortunately it has to be done under general anesthesia, and it is very inconvenient to do general anesthesia every three months, maybe after, you know, the um, dexibotulinum toxin is approved. Perhaps this might be an option for some patients. Uh, Deep brain stimulation is something that can really be helpful uh, for um, this dystonia, cervical dystonia. I had one patient with pretty bad 
um, enterocolis. Of course, that patient did not have uh, MSA, but that resulted in you know significant improvement uh, of symptoms and quality of life. So truncal dystonia. So this is also called leaning tower of Pisa syndrome. As you can see, this is the leaning tower of Pisa, and this is a patient with the trunk, you know, leaning onto one side, as you can see. So you can see the Pisa syndrome, or you can see something that is called a bent spine or cantochromia, where there is extreme forward flexion of the thoracolumbar spine uh, and with tacit, you know, dropping of both arms, so patients just kind of lean over. And the Pisa syndrome is rapidly evolving and very severe, you know, actual, so central dystonia. Uh, with forward but also laterally oriented truncal muscles and a combined imaging uh, and emg you know you can use ultrasound and emg botulinum toxin approach emg is electromyography it's a needle that is connected to a machine that can hear how the muscles uh, fire and this kind of approach may yield some success uh, you know uh, in some uh, in this paper particularly that i presented that the success rate greater than 80 percent in patients with, you know, this was Parkinson's disease, and certainly the same can be applied to atypical Parkinsonism, which is what MSA is. So focal limb dystonia, unilateral dystonia of the limb can be seen in atypical Parkinsonism. This really responds suboptimally to pharmacological therapies, including, you know, levodopa, baclofen. In some patients, botulinum toxin injections failed to improve the limb function despite that there was moderate relaxation with easier passive movements. But in some other patients, botulinum toxin injections may be particularly helpful for prominent focal dystonia in early stage. Uh, APD is atypical Parkinsonism. And disease progression with worsening Parkinsonism and an apraxia will reduce, you know, uh, apraxia's inability to perform certain motor movements in spite of the fact that the patients do not have any weakness or sensory loss. Uh, can, you know, re reduce the initial functional benefit. Botulinum toxin can still be considered in late disease in order to, you know, reduce the pain and uh, to be able to be able to open some of these limbs and facilitate hygiene because sometimes, you know, the the hand, the fist is closed and so uh, the, you know, palm can have uh, problems with hygiene and prevent some secondary contractures which can develop as part of progressive disease. So overactive bladder, this is, you know, major clinical problem in patients with both Parkinson's disease and MSA. These patients complain of urinary urgency, frequency, incontinence, where they pee, -pee on themselves and increase post-void residuals. So after you have, uh, you know, finished uh, voiding urine, and if somebody were to go and measure the amount of urine that is still present in the uh, in the bladder, that's called post-void residual. And in patients with MSA, uh, you know, volume of 100 milliliters or more is considered, you know, to be significant. So patients with Parkinson's disease and MSA who had detrusor, that's the muscle, or activity that was unresponsive to conventional medical therapy reported that botulinum toxin injections improved the urinary symptoms. So daytime and nighttime urinary frequency decreased. And most importantly, you know, none of these patients had further episodes of urgency or urge urinary incontinence, which certainly results in, you know, symptomatic relief and improvement in quality of life. So siluria is, is not a form of dystonia. This is really uh, drooling. It's a characteristic manifestation in all Parkinsonian syndromes. Uh, it can certainly cause psychosocial embarrassment and, you know, the excess saliva can compromise swallowing function with the risk of choking or aspiration or aspiration pneumonia uh, that can be fatal. So low-dose botulinum toxin injections in these glands, so parotid and submandibular salivary glands uh, can result in, in improvement. Uh, no severe adverse effects were seen in this particular paper that I'm showing over here. Even in patients who had, you know, moderate amount of swallowing dysfunction at baseline. So the effects of botulinum toxin, you know, A, because there's type A and type B, we're talking about type A, lasts about four to five months and thus Repetitive injections are necessary for long-term control. Uh, this botulinum toxin has been used safely and effectively and should be considered in patients that are resistant to, you know, conventional um, treatments such as medications. So in summary, 
Dystonia in multiple system atrophy has multiple and multifaceted presentations. You can have blepharospasm, orofacial dystonia, strider, cervical dystonia, focal limb dystonia, and overactive bladder as some of the presentations. Botulinum toxins have shown proven efficacy in their management with mild side effects. These, these can be tolerated pretty well. So use of botulinum toxins should be considered, you know, certainly balancing the risk of side effects, which are dysphagia, swallowing difficulty, and, you know, paralysis or muscle weakness. And with that, I would like to thank the audience for this opportunity. Thank you very much.